I'm excited to be joined today by Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar. He is a psychologist and the best-selling author of the books, Happier and Being Happy, among others. Today, we're going to be talking about the science of happiness and anti-fragility. Tal, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Thank you, Adam. It's good to be here. Thank you. So I think it would be good to kick things off by talking about the difference between happiness and not being happy and not being unhappy. Yeah, so, um, you know, m m most people think that uh, in order to be happy, we simply have to be not happy or another way of putting it, uh, to be doing well, we just need to not be depressed or not be mm -hmm. anxious. Uh, well, it turns out that that's not enough. You know, if you think about uh, our well-being on a continuum, then, uh, you know, on the, on, on the negative side here, yeah, we have uh, anxiety and depression and sadness. And then there is a neutral point, a zero, when we're doing okay, mm -hmm. but we're still not flourishing. We're still not happy. That would have to go to the positive side. And that has been the mistake to, to a great extent of traditional psychology. You know, most people, most psychologists thought, well, if you're depressed, you're feeling down, you know, go to a therapist, uh, get rid of the depression or get rid of the, the anxiety, and then you'll be fine. Yeah, you'll be fine. But as uh, um, Henry David Thoreau said, you know, most men live lives of quiet desperation. And, you know, quiet mm -hmm. desperation is probably that okay state. And I think we, we can do better. And I mm -hmm. think we deserve to do better. And this is where the science of happiness comes in. Let's not just focus on eliminating the negative. Let's not just go beyond being not happy. Let's actually go and become happier. Mm -hmm. Let's flourish. Right. And then there, there are different types of happier. So in the scale that you kind of just outlined, you have, you have negative on one end, and then you have neutral, and then you have happy. But then if you keep going on the happiness end, you get to something like mania. Like we don't want to be happy all the time. We want to be content or we want to find meaning in our lives. So, so there's another thing that, uh, what, what are the technical terms you use for that? Yeah, good. So, you know, so, so the way I look at it is that um, it's not so much going along the happiness continuum. You know, happiness is, is, is one construct and I'm mm -hmm. pretty happy having this as, as the construct. However, it has sub-construct constructs. Mm -hmm. So happiness comprises of different elements. For example, as you pointed out, uh, a sense of meaning and purpose. Uh, for example, uh, a pleasure is an element of happiness. For example, of course, relationships are an important part of happiness. Uh, curiosity, intellectual development is part of a happy life. So happiness is a multi-faceted uh, construct that, um, and, and we need to think about the different, uh, different elements of mm -hmm. that construct if we want to lead a, a full, if we want to fulfill our potential for mm -hmm. happiness. Right. It's, it's interesting how there, this, there's this sort of delayed gratification element to happiness. I always use the example of studying. Most people might not enjoy hitting the books, but then if you, if you achieve something meaningful, whether you're getting a good grade on a test or ultimately achieving a degree that you think is going to improve your life outcome, it's, it's happiness, but it's something more than that. It's like this feeling of accomplishment. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the misconception that so many people have about happiness is that it's um, essentially synonymous with uh, pleasure. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, they would use it in the context of, you know, I went to the beach today, I was so happy, or I had an ice cream, I was so happy. Uh, and of course, you know, each to his or her own. However, if you, if you think a little bit more about it, what they're talking about is pleasure. Now, if they equate happiness with pleasure, that, that's one thing, you know, they, they can define it however they wish. But happiness goes beyond that. Happiness is also, as you point out, about a sense of accomplishment because that provides uh, our life with a sense of meaning and purpose. You know, if I studied hard for an exam and, uh, and you know, ended up doing well, that, that's purposeful. I'm unlikely to experience purposeful if uh, I have a good ice cream. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is important to distinguish these states. In other words, it's important to break down happiness into its elements. Mm -hmm. Right. So you mentioned that historically psychology has focused a bit more on the negative end, especially clinical psychology, focusing on how can we treat mental illness and, and get rid of all these negative experiences 
But even once you do that, you you arrive at neutral. You don't arrive at happy. Yes, yeah, so it, it's understandable that it was so because it's uh, you know think about it on the individual level. If something hurts, you know, if I have a, a toothache, my top top priority is getting rid of that, alleviating the pain. If I have a, a psychological ache, my top priority is alleviating this. And that's on the individual micro level. It's also on the societal macro level. If we have so many, you know, I, I get this often. So many people come to me and say, just, just look at the data. Look at how many more people are anxious today. Look at how many more people are uh, uh, depressed today, which is true. And then the next question is, how can you focus on happiness? You know, focus on, 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 on getting rid of those, those things that are creating so much pain. And they have, they, have, they have a good point there. I think we do need to focus on these things, but that doesn't preclude also focusing on the things that make life worth living for two reasons. Mm -hmm. First of all, because the negation of those things will not lead to happiness, which we just talked about. But the second thing, and, and, and probably even more important, is that if you work on happiness, if you work on those you know, zero to plus uh, traits, uh, characteristics, experiences, you're also indirecting, indirectly helping yourself deal with the negatives. So in other words, if I cultivate more well-being, if I cultivate more joy in my life, I'll be in a better position to deal with the hardships, difficulties, and challenges when these arise, and they ine inevitably do at times. In other words, it's not just about getting me from you know, the plus to more plus or from the zero to the, uh, to the positive. It's also about helping me better deal with the negative. You know, a person with healthy relationships is more resilient, better able to deal with difficulties. A person who expresses gratitude, who appreciates his, her life is uh, also more resilient, better able to deal with challenges when mm -hmm. they arise. In that sense, would you say that this emerging field of, of positive psychology is analogous to preventive medicine? Um, I'm not sure if I would say it's analogous, but it's certainly part of. Mm -hmm. So the um, cultivating all those uh, uh, traits, characteristics that I discussed, whether it's focusing on strength, appreciation, um, uh, relationships, these are all things that potentially prevent, not, not completely, nothing that we know of completely prevents, but to a great extent prevent uh, much, um, much pain and, and much, many of mm -hmm. the uh, mental psychological illnesses. Right. You alluded to increasing rates of mental illness nowadays. Do you think that's genuine or do you think it's something like people are becoming more open to talking about anxiety and depression and, and it, it, it just reflects that way in the data? Yeah, good. You know, the, the, the answer to your question, Adam, is yes, um, because it's both. Mm -hmm. Yes, people are more uh, open to talking about it. You know, we have celebrities uh, openly uh, talking about their, um, th their suffering. And, and naturally, we, we feel more comfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are clearly going up. And how do we know that? We know that uh, at least in part because suicide rates are going up. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, suicide rates are, you know, a reflection of the health or ill health of our society. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of the uh, evolutionary mismatch hypothesis, the idea that uh, we, we're less happy now just because we're not, not really suited to, to this modern world, that we're, uh, and, and not only that, but the struggles that we face, uh, since, since we're sort of protected in some sense, we, we live in this bubble that struggles that might have in our evolutionary past have, have been something we were used to dealing with. Now we're, we're sort of more fragile in some sense. Yeah. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that that is at least in part the reason for the rising levels of, uh, of mental health problems. Why? Let, let, let me just give a few examples. One example is um, uh, physical exercise. We know that regular physical exercise um, contributes to our psychological well-being to the same extent as our most powerful psychiatric medication. 
So you exercise, you know, three to five times a week, 30 minutes to an hour each time. And the impact of it will be identical to our most powerful uh, medication. Mm -hmm. In fact, it works in the same way. It releases norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. Now, today, I have to teach this uh, to, to myself, to my children, to my students and clients. In the past, it wasn't necessary because everyone was exercising all the time. Right. Why? Because we had to, you know, fend for, our, for, for ourselves. We had to uh, hunt, gather, walk. You know, today we, you know, we, we, we call and we, uh, you know, we press a button and we have, uh, you know, machines carrying us from point A to point B. And not even that today, because we can sit in our room and, and have a machine transport our communication as, as we're doing right now. So we're not physically active. We're sedentary. That's a mismatch. Right. So we weren't born to be sitting down all day. We were born to run after uh, an antelope for lunch or run away from a lion so that we don't become lunch. Right, right. Um, not only so exercise, but diet, I'll, I'll, diet as well. Sorry, Anna? Not only exercise, but diet, uh, especially the amount of sugar we're eating. Exactly. Uh, although there's this interesting, this, this interesting thing about like comfort eating. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we're all familiar with it. You, you eat junk food and in the moment you feel good. And then afterwards you feel bad. You pay a price. Exactly. So I, that's a clear mismatch. You know, when, even when I was growing up and, uh, you know, so that was, you know, 40 years ago as, as a kid, um, we didn't have as many options as uh, bad options, poor options that, that, that we have today. You know, so my, you know, my, my mom cooked and, um, and I would eat fruits and vegetables because that's what we had at home. And, um, and today, the amount of junk food that is accessible easily and, you know, not freely, but almost freely available to so many people, that's wreaking havoc, not just on our physical health, of course, with obesity and chronic disease, also on our mental health. So that's another mismatch. Here's a third mismatch. Relationships. You know, growing up, again, 40 years ago, 45 years ago, I went downstairs and I, you know, I played with my friends. Today, um, and, and what did we play? You know, we ran around and we biked around and we, and, and we, um, and, and we, you know, we walked and we built things. You know, today, you know, they build things on Minecraft. They move around on, you know, on Fortnite. You know, and that, and, and, and this, you know, doing it with your fingers, that, that's not exercise. Right. Certainly not enough, you know, a mismatch there. And also social interactions. It's not just the exercise. Social interactions, you were, you know, with your tribe or with your, you know, friends on, on, on the street later on. Today, we have to make an effort to actually physically meet people. That's a mismatch. Right. right. So it seems like in many ways, we understand the secrets to happiness. We know you need to exercise. You need to eat right. You need to have close uh, social ties. You need to be doing something that you find meaningful. All of those things are they almost seem like cliches. So why, why do you think we have such a hard time following that advice? Yeah, you know, Voltaire once uh, remarked that common sense is not so common. Right. <laughs> um, and, um, and yes, you're right. These things are cliches. They're, they're, they're obvious that they're, they're certainly no rocket science. Um, and yet that common sense is not, is not so common. Um, so that's one reason. The other reason is because we have many competing uh, forces that go against the what, what is natural and what is commonsensical. So, for instance, it's it's natural to eat fruit because it tastes good and it's sweet. But then come you know the the um, the, the the food companies today and, and and modernity, and we've made things even sweeter than they mm -hmm. are in nature. And suddenly you know having an orange is not enough, and chocolate tastes a lot better. Right. Um, or, um, you know, being psychologically uh, uh, stimulated, you know, that's exciting. And, you know, we want to see new things and, and, and that's great. And that's why we enjoy, you know, visiting the, we used, we used to enjoy visiting the adjoining tribe or, uh, or, uh, or, or, or exploring in the forest. And that was interesting and exciting. Today, we can visit the whole world literally at our fingertips, you know, why leave? 
when I can find out anything and, and, and everything. So we have, um, we, we are living in a world where there is a lot of sensationalism mm -hmm. and we're losing touch with our senses, with our sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Again, you have, a, you, have, you have a mismatch. So the things that are naturally attractive to us are, are becoming too accessible. And then we need more and more and more. You know, think about sex as well. You know, in the past, uh, you know, you, you usually would get married to that one person that your parents decided you would, you know, marry with. Today, we have access to many more, you know, dates, but also we have access to pornography. And that's desensitizing us. And that's leading to, um, uh, in, in the long term, again, in the short term, like junk food, it feels good. But in the long term, it's uh, wreaking havoc on relationships. Mm -hmm. So there's another evolutionary theory that has to do with scarcity. And the idea is that people um, in, who grow up in resource scarce environments are going to be more short term in their orientation. So do you think there's a difference between um, people who were raised when things weren't so prosperous versus children being raised like right now? Yeah, so I think the jury's still out on the on the theory as a whole because again, th again, this is my hypothesis. I have not tested it. So yeah, people who are who are born with scarcity, and it makes sense, would think about more about you know short term. How can I get the next you know meal mm -hmm. on on the table? But people who have too much, or rather have it all, I think they would also grow uh, up to um, to be more short term oriented. Why? Because, uh, you know, everything is accessible. They're getting it. They, they, they do not need to exercise their, uh, you know, delayed gratification muscles because I don't need to wait for a new computer or for food or for, uh, for a new game. I just get it. And then I want more and more of it. Again, we become desensitized and we, um, we seek new sensations. But of course, the same game that I got yesterday is not enough today. I need something even more than that or more games or um, more stimulation. Mm -hmm. So I, my, again, my hypothesis is that we will have a U curve here. Right, In other right. words, that you will, um, you will struggle at the two extremes. You, in, in the sense of you'll have short-term focus when, you're, when there's scarcity, you'll have short-term focus when there is too much. And ideally what you want, as, as, as in many cases, is the, the golden mean. Mm -hmm. Right. That makes a lot of sense because you, you would think that when we, when we grow up in, in such a wealthy, resource-rich environment, we, you don't have to go to junk food. You know that food is always going to be there, so you might as well eat healthy because we don't really need the extra calories. Um, but then you, you, you see the opposite. You see that at the high extremes of the wealth, uh, and those, those are the t types of people that can afford, I guess, the luxury of extra time to exercise and to, to buy the healthier foods. And, and you know, you, you see the, the, the problem on the two extremes in the work of uh, Sunia Luthar. She's mm -hmm. a professor at Columbia uh, today, originally from India. And uh, what her work uh, revolves around is the underprivilege of privilege. And mm -hmm. specifically what she shows is that many of the um, societal or, or communal elements that we see in, uh, in very poor neighborhoods are essentially being replicated when we look at very wealthy neighborhoods. So it's mm -hmm. things like uh, a lack of meaning and purpose in life. It's things like short-term thinking. It's things like um, uh, depression and uh, high levels of depression, anxiety, and suicide. And, um, and, and I think this is a consequence of the, of the U-shape model that um that we're discussing uh -huh. okay so could we could we go into more detail about that u-shape model specifically the peak of it for for people for i guess the average person we're talking about um in in western civilization um so so what what is the the ideal and, and you see that um the, the u-shape in so many places for example parenting so the you know the ideal parent is not the uh um, overly uh, uh, permissive parent. Yeah, you can do anything and, uh, and you know, you, you, you complete freedom. Nor is it the, the, the dictator, the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the authoritarian parent. The ideal parent 
is uh, the parent who's somewhere in the middle, who's authoritative. You know, there are certain boundaries and within those boundaries, there is freedom. So that would be an example of that, you know, uh, um, sweet spot in terms of the, of the U-curve, in terms of difficulties and hardships in life that is directly related to growing up in scarcity or growing up in, uh, in, in, a, in privilege. Um, you want children to struggle. Right. Of course you do, because you know, without struggle, you don't grow stronger. You know, the example I often give parents is if you send your child to the gym and they lift all weights on zero, they won't get stronger. Mm -hmm. So every time you're preventing them from struggle, you're actually preventing them from growing stronger, from becoming more resilient. Right. Uh, at the same time, you know, a child needs parents, you know, to help them, protect them, guide them. So they do need help um, in moderation. I think um, Maria Montessori put it uh, best. She said, do not do for the child what the child can do for him or herself. Mm -hmm. So what they cannot do for themselves, where they need help, yeah, of course, be there for them. But if they can, you know, solve problems, overcome struggles, uh, deal with challenges by themselves, everything from, uh, you know, tying their shoelaces to uh, dealing with, um, with, um, uh, with, with uh, social challenges uh, in school. If they can do it themselves, let them do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. There's this interesting paradox about you could imagine someone who who came from a rough upbringing and then they grew up to be successful and now they want to provide their children for their children, give them the things that they never had. And yet in doing so, they might be making their children weaker. Yeah, it's exactly right. And you see it a lot uh, because they say, I don't want my, my, my children to go through what I had to go through. And they're probably partially right. You do want to prevent uh, some of the experience that you went through, um, but not all. And, and, and remember, don't make it too easy on them. I remember my, uh, my first job out of, uh, out of college, actually during college as well, was uh, working for a shipping company. And uh, the, uh, the, the founder of that company was, uh, um, was already in his uh, 70s when, when, when I started working there and I worked for the Sun. And I remember the son telling me that when he was seven years old, he had to go on a ship. It was their ship and scrub it uh, and, and clean it and, you know, work, you know, in the, in the, in the engine room. And, you know, maybe seven is taking it a little bit too far. Um, but but, but the, the, the point is that he had to work very hard and he became and is, uh, you know, a, an extraordinary and appreciative CEO of, of the company, you know, having inherited it from, you know, his father who did very well, um, but he had to work very hard. He wasn't given, a, you know, he wasn't given everything that he wanted to be given as a seven-year-old or as a 17-year-old, he struggled. Mm -hmm. Right, there's this old Roman saying, uh, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, Weak men create hard times and the cycle repeats. Yeah, exactly. The fall of the Roman Empire. Um, and, and, and by the way, I, I, we were seeing something similar, you know, in the uh, North American Empire today, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there were certainly very uh, um, strong men and women who created um, the, you know, the United States of, of America. And again, they were imperfect and, of course, made many mistakes. But they were very, you know, strong people who did amazing things as well. Mm -hmm. It led to good times. And the concern is, you know, will it follow the same, uh, the same trajectory as the Roman Empire? Uh, right. We, we could talk about education as a case study of that, because there seems to be an increasing movement uh, during COVID and in med schools, for example, for pass fail grading. And on one hand, it seems like it can reduce discrimination because people from disadvantaged backgrounds are, are more likely to do poorly. Uh, but if they only have to meet the standard of pass, it's, you know, they, they won't be left behind. But then on the other hand, pass is a much lower standard than striving for A's. Yeah. Yeah, this is um, a, a difficult question because there are, you know, as, as many important questions, that there are two sides to it. So mm -hmm. on the one hand, you know, I, I certainly can uh, um, 
sympathize with Abraham Maslow, who said universities shouldn't be grading students. You know, students should be intrinsically motivated uh, to work. On the other hand, um, you know, this is not a perfect world and intrinsic motivation is not always enough to, you know, to, to, um, to work hard for, for a course uh, or even to get up in the morning. So I think a combination of intrinsic and extrinsic is, uh, is necessary. And if you look at the, um, you know, at, at, at the work on, uh, on peak performers by, mm -hmm. uh, by uh, Anders Ericsson and, and others, you, you find the need for both extrinsic and intrinsic. Mm -hmm. um, now, what do we do about, about, about grades? Um, the key here, I don't think is the, the grades, whether you grade or not, the key here is to have high standards. Now, if grades are necessary to maintain high standards, then yes, by all means, I do not think that it's healthy to lower down our standards so that more people uh, can get in. I think we need programs to raise the, the people to those standards rather than to lower the standards. Because if you lower the standards, it's, it's uh, you know, by definition, a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you, you will get to, to a place of, you know, there's a movie, Adam, I don't know if you've, uh, you've seen it, called uh, Idiocracy. I haven't. And it's, um, I must say, it's not the, an, an, an amazing movie. It's not a, you know, a great work of art, but it's a very important movie showing where uh, our culture may, may, may end up if we continue lowering the standards. Idiocracy. Right. right. I'll certainly put that on my list. So an another thing we could talk about with regards to education and intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation, uh, especially within psychology, anyone who's doing a PhD, even anyone who's listening to this, probably int very interested in the ideas of psychology to the point that we're going out of our way to spend our free time thinking about them, talking about them. And then there's also the scientific aspect, the statistics aspect. So I always enjoyed um, Pretty much, pretty much any of the psychology courses I took when we were just talking about ideas, the statistical training I had to undergo, that was a lot more difficult to me. That was something, it was, it was more like a necessary evil to get to the, to the desirable end goal. Yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously, uh, I, I believe that both are important mm -hmm. and that we need to focus on those things that, um, that are our strengths. So right. let me just say a few words about strength and then, and then go back to statistics versus ideas or statistics uh -huh. and ideas. So when, when, when I talk about strength, I, I divide them into two types of strength. The, what I call performance strengths, which are about, you know, what am I good at? You know, am, am I good at crunching numbers? Am I good at listening? You know, am I good at, uh, um, at, uh, you know, so, social interactions? Am I good at mathematics or, uh, or, or writing? What am I good at? What are my strengths? Mm -hmm. This is the first kind of strength, performance strength. The second kind of strength are um, your um, passion strengths. Right. What are you passionate about? Or in other words, what gives you strength? What energizes you? What do you love to do? Is it listening to people? Is it crunching numbers? Is it you know, mathematics or, or writing uh, or, or, or spending time with, uh, with people? You know, what are your passion strengths? Now, the performance strength and the passion strength can be different for the same person. And the question is, can you find the overlap? Mm -hmm. You know, so for me, for example, I'm actually, you know, not bad at, uh, at crunching numbers. You know, I'm, I was good at statistics, but it was never my passion. Right. Um, on the other hand, uh, I've always enjoyed uh, thinking about ideas. You know, I was, I was a joint uh, major in philosophy and psychology. So I've always enjoyed uh, ideas. And, um, and I'm, you know, pretty good at thinking about ideas or, or bring ideas together, together or understanding others' ideas. So when I do psychology, I focus much more on that element rather than the statistical element, rather than the research part. However, I'm very glad that there are people for whom it's performance and passion strength to deal with numbers, to do these studies, because I rely on them, because I teach their, their stuff. You know, I always tell my students, you know, I, I didn't invent anything. I didn't, you know, I've, I've done very little research in my life. However, everything that you get from me is based on rigorous research, because I draw on those people who, you know, love 
to, to do research and we're very good at it. Mm -hmm. In other words, where their performance strength and their passion strengths overlap. Mm -hmm. So ideas people, statistics people are important. If you have both, you know, then, then I, you know, I guess I envy you. Uh, right. And uh, <laughs> so what do we do about our, our society seems to uh, place much more weight on the passion side. It's like, do what you're passionate about now. Mm -hmm. And, and to the extreme that can be taken as uh, it, you know, in the, in the case of Maslow's suggestion, if we were doing coursework only based on intrinsic motivation, if we didn't have to be judged on it, then probably everyone would avoid the statistics courses, except for the small minority of people who are intrinsically interested in it. Yes. But without any of that uh, more rigorous training, we wouldn't be psychologists. At best case, we would be philosophers. So there, there's this, like, it, it's, it was necessary in some sense, even though it was unpleasant. I, I could not agree more. Um, again, I, I don't think I really suffered during statistical. Uh -huh. uh, I'm exaggerating my suffering a bit yeah, as well. I mean, I did a master's degree in it, but right. Yeah. Well, well, many people do. You know, if you if you uh, you know do a survey on graduate students in uh, in in psychology, yeah, there are some who are you know just you know superstars when it comes to statistics, statistics and love it, but most are not. And, and don't love it, you know, though um, you would in the statistics department, that's a different story, but among psychologists, well, however, as you put, as, as you put it, you know, it's a necessary evil. It's, a, it's an important element. Why? Because it teaches you to think more rigorously, because the difference between positive psychology and self-help, or the difference between the science of happiness and new age, is that the former relies on on research and that means statistics on learning how to to understand what you know what a statistically significant result is on understanding what meta-analysis is and on even understanding you know what it, what, it, what a t-test is does that mean that you need to do that every day all day no you don't you know choose the path that that is most suitable to you however mm -hmm. you need the foundation the fundamentals in rigorous thinking mm -hmm. so we talked you know, about my, how, my, how uh, happiness has sort of these these two meanings. There's the there's the one that's more close to meaning, and there's the one that that seems more commonly used closer to pleasure. So the statistics degree is an example of something that might have been unpleasant but meaningful. And how do we find the balance between when, when something is unenjoyable, knowing whether we should take that as sort of a signal from our mind to say, okay, I should do something else. This isn't right for me. Versus this is something I need to push through. Yeah, so there isn't a, an easy, you know, I can't tell, you know, it's, it's 42. And then <laughs> that, that's the right answer. Um, it's, it's not that simple. However, we, ha we can have guiding principles to, to help us. So let, let's look at the, uh, at the extremes. So one extreme is um, you delay gratification. And you say, well, statistics is important for me. And then, um, you know, doing research on a topic that I don't like is important for me because that is the topic that will get me into a, a good, um, you know, a good, you know, program as a, as a faculty. And then I have to do research that is, 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 is um, valued by my colleagues so that, you know, I can get tenure. And you know what, by the time you get tenure, you don't know any other way. You're already stuck in your ways and you continue to delay gratification indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we don't li live indefinitely. So you, we spend, and so many people, millions and billions of people spend their lives delaying gratification, living in what, what I call the rat race uh, quadrant. On the other hand, we have those people in, 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 who do not delay gratification, you know, who want the marshmallow right now, who are, uh, about uh, seeking pleasure constantly, only doing things that they are passionate about, not willing to go through meaningful endurance, in the words of David Schnarch, meaningful endurance. And, um, and they won't be happy in the long term either. So what we need to do is find the golden mean. Now, the golden mean doesn't mean 50%. The golden mean is, is in a different place for, for, for different people. And it means experimenting. You know, Mah Mahatma Gandhi talked about his life uh, as an experiment. In fact, he taught his 
the title of his autobiography is My Experiments with Truth. Not my finding truth, not the ultimate truth. It's my experiment with truth. And that is what we need to do. So we need to experiment and try. And we delay gratification if we find, well, that's too much. That's, uh, you know, that's actually uh, exacting too high of a price or it's lasting for too long. Well, maybe I should experiment with something else. And if, uh, if you know, if I find myself living too much as a, as a hedonist, and not feeling fulfilled as a result, because hedonism is not sustainable, then, uh, well, maybe I should uh, experiment with something else and try things and ideally, and here is the ideal, ideally find that place where we're doing things that are meaningful to us, that are that provides us with a deep sense of purpose and that we enjoy. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if I, you know, on, on a personal level, Teaching is extremely meaningful to me. You know, it's my calling. And most of the time, not all of the time, I love to teach. Mm -hmm. Now, do I enjoy grading papers? I don't. But that's a necessary evil. It's part of a bigger picture in which I'm mostly, not only, but mostly doing things that are meaningful to me and that are pleasurable to me. That is the ideal to strive for. Can we reach that ideal and live the perfect life? No, no one can. We all have to do things that are either not pleasurable to us or not meaningful to us. You know, that's part of the deal. Mm -hmm. Um, But we can get closer and closer to that ideal. Right. So in some sense, we don't choose our interests. Our interests choose Mm -hmm. us. We have to find out what works. Um, Yes, and... So um, what do I mean by that? So yes, you know, we, we, we have a passion. You know, my, my mom recently reminded me that when I was seven, I wrote uh, aphorisms. In fact, she found the notebook in which I wrote it. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when, when I was seven, now there, you know, nothing to write home about. There was no, 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 no one I think would look at them and say, hmm, this guy should be a writer. However, however, it shows an inclination from a very young age uh, to write and not just to write stories because I never did write stories, but I did write advice. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was seven, just learned how to read and write. So, um, so we see inclinations and many people have this, you know, the, 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 the doctor who played doctor when, you know, they were, when they were, when they were five or the the teacher who would, you know, always teach when, when friends got together. So, you know, we have those inclinations, some of us, not, 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 not all. And sometimes it takes time and sometimes they're misleading. Because, you know, when I was uh, a child, I also thought I'd be, you know, I'd be a professional basketball player. And, you know, it didn't turn out too well on that front for me, um, being, you know, five, seven or you know, five, six and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, so again, experimenting, but very often the interest finds us at the same time, at the same time. We can also cultivate passions because, you know, teaching, um, I didn't always think I would, I would, I would be, in fact, I never thought I would become a teacher. My mom's a teacher, my dad's a teacher, but, and, uh, but it never, never attracted, I was never attracted to it, but, uh, you know, I started doing it and I had some wonderful mentors such as uh, Professor Philip Stone and such as uh, Professor Alan Langer and Richard Hackman. Um, who, who were teachers, and, and, and then I encountered uh, Marva Collins, who, who became my role model as a teacher. I said, you know, maybe, maybe I'll try it. And I experimented with it, and, and I wasn't particularly good at it, and I got better and better. And as I got better and better, I became more and more passionate. Mm-hmm. So sometimes, you know, you, you fake it until you make it, um, or you, your attitude follows your behavior. And, um, and that happened for me when, when, when it comes to teaching. Uh-huh. So in some sense, we've been talking about all of this is like how to, how to fine tune your life, how to find the right balance for any particular problem, as if there's an answer out there. Um, but it, it seems to get more complicated once you throw in individual differences into the picture. So for example, if we're talking about big five personality traits, some people are more conscientious than others. Some people are more neurotic than others. And these things can, can seem to get in the way, both on the positive and negative end of how you're gonna achieve this happy life. Yes, yeah, so um, 
when I talk about happiness, I always um, distinguish between three levels. Um, or when we seek happiness for ourselves, we need to distinguish among three levels. The first level is the universal. Um, and that is about, you know, we all, whether, you know, we live in, uh, in, uh, in, in New York City or uh, Beijing or Nairobi, uh, you know, we, we, we all need a sense of meaning and purpose in life. We all need relationships. That's a universal. We all experience sadness and anger and, and, um, and we all even have, uh, you know, facial expressions that are universal. So there are certain universals and, 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 and we know that. At the same time, there are also uh, cultural differences. And you know, in one culture, what, con what, what will contribute to healthy relationships is different from another culture. Um, you know, more collectivistic, individualistic cultures, the relationship to power uh, matters. So there are many elements that are cultural, that are different in you know, New York, Beijing, and Nairobi. So that's the second level. You have the universal as the first, then you have the cultural. The third level is the personal level. Because two people living in New York, or you know, two people living even in the same household in Nairobi, will have different needs and they will uh, appreciate different relationships and that they, they will find meaning and purpose in different things. Mm -hmm. So finding meaning and purpose or enjoying relationships is universal. It's different in different places. It's also different within those places um, between people. So you have the universal, you have the cultural, and you have the personal. Right. For the universal and the cultural, we have research. And very important research being done in the field of happiness on the universal and the cultural level. On the personal level, we need me-search. <laughs> I like and that. And that is no less important. You know, uh, my students in the, the, the Happiness Studies Academy go through uh, a minimum of year long program. We also have the master's program, which is longer, but, but the certificate program is a year long. Mm -hmm. And during that year, they learn a lot about research, about the universal. They learn a great deal about cultural differences because we have students from over 70 countries. So they learn the research there and they also teach each other and me. Mm -hmm. But then we also have me search. The students spend a lot of time journaling, reflecting on their lives and, and experimenting with truths in their lives. And that's no less of an important element of the, uh, of the happiness pie. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us more about the Happiness Studies Academy? Um, happily. So, um, so Adam, the, the, the idea for the Happiness Studies Academy was uh, born in my mind, at least uh, about six years ago, I think, or six and a half years ago. It was when I was on a transatlantic flight and uh, on my way to the, to the US, when I was in one of those uh, states where I was uh, ex you know, extremely tired, too tired to read, but not uh, tired enough to fall asleep in the discomfort of a, of a plane seat. And um, at, at that point, a question came to mind. And the question was, how is it that there is a field of study for psychology, which is my field, um, um, philosophy, history, biology, neuroscience, geography, literature, economics, you know, you name it, but there's no field of study for happiness. Yeah, there is a positive psychology, but that's just the psychology of happiness. What about what philosophers had to say about it, like uh, Aristotle or Lao Tzu? What about what um, you know, uh, um, literary geniuses throughout history had to say about happiness? Whether it's uh, you know Shakespeare or uh, Chinua Kebe or uh, Marianne Evans? What about what film has to say about happiness? You know, whether it's the you know the the films from the you know, 1940s to modern films from Hollywood to Bollywood. What about what um, e economists have to say about happiness? And they have a lot to say about it. Or neuroscientists. Why isn't there a field, I ask myself, or rather an interdisciplinary field of study that looks at 
the different disciplines, thinkers, research, wisdom, and what they have to say about the good life. And I resolved on that flight, by the way, I, I was no longer tired. From that point, I, I just could not stop writing. And I, I thought, why? And, and I wanted to help create a field of happiness studies. As a result of uh, that thinking about three years after, I co-founded the Happiness Studies Academy. Our first um, uh, offering was, still uh, very much exists, a certificate in happiness studies. And uh, in uh, a, a few months from uh, now, we're launching the world's first uh, master's degree in happiness studies in uh, conjunction with uh, Centenary University which is going to be a fully uh, online, uh, fully accredited master's degree where uh, students will go through a process and understand how they can help themselves become happier and no less important, how they can help others do the same. So that's what I've been doing with the Happiness Studies Academy. That's amazing. I, lo I love framing it as its own interdisciplinary field. Tal, the last thing I want to ask you about is on the surface, going to seem like it's going against everything we've been talking about, the science of happiness, chasing happiness in your own life. Um, your TED Talk, which I would highly recommend everyone listen to, is titled, uh, Don't Be Happy, Be Anti-Fragile, something <laughs> like that. Uh, so, but yeah, let's, let's talk about that. Do we want to chase happiness or do we want to chase anti-fragility? Probably yes, yes to both. <laughs> You've spent enough time with me to know um, to, know, to know the answer, right? Um, yeah, the answer is uh, is is yes, and and they're not in opposition to one another. So first of all, this is a, a big think talk that you're uh, that you're referring to, where oh, I where, where I talked about uh, anti fragility. So let me just say a few words about anti fragility. Uh, this is actually a term that was coined by Nassim Taleb, who's uh, today a professor. Uh, at NYU, originally from Lebanon. And um, Nassim Taleb talks about anti-fragility as, in essence, what, what I think of as resilience 2.0. So resilience 1.0 is uh, the ability to bounce back. You know, you put pressure on certain material, you squish it. If it's resilient, you let go, it goes back to where it was before. You drop a ball. If it's resilient, it bounces back up to where it was before. That's why we talk about resilience people, resilient people as bouncing back. Anti-fragility, resilience 2.0, takes this to the next level. And what it does is if you put pressure on certain material and you let go, if it's resilient, it goes back to where it was before. If it's anti-fragile, it actually grows bigger, stronger, better. Or if you drop a ball, if it's resilient, it just bounces back up to where it was before. If it's anti-fragile, resilient 2.0, it bounces back higher than when it was before. Mm -hmm. Now, we, it turns out that we have anti-fragile systems within us and around us. So, for example, our muscular system, you put pressure on your muscles and they don't just go back to where they were before. Over time, you actually grow stronger, healthier, bigger. So we are an anti-fragile system physiologically and psychologically, mm -hmm. potentially, because just like in the gym, you can injure yourself. You can be fragile or anti-fragile. So psychologically, you can be fragile, break down, or anti-fragile, grow from hardship. Uh -huh. And in a sense, the whole field of happiness studies, everything we talked about today, for instance, whether it's regular physical exercise, whether it's cultivating relationships, whether it's um, appreciating our life more, whether it's journaling, all these are tools to help us become more anti-fragile, to increase the likelihood, we cannot guarantee it, but to increase the likelihood that rather than breaking after hardships, difficulties, and challenges, will actually become stronger, healthier, and happier. Mm -hmm. Right, there's another inverse U-curve, right? You, you want some optimal level of stress to get you into that zone of proximal development, but if you push yourself too far, you, you could snap, so. Exactly, so um, I don't know, Adam, in, in your studies, if you, if you even remember, but one of the first theories that we studied in, uh, in uh, introduction to psychology, in psych one, 
was the Yerkes Dotson inverted U curve. This is a study, if I'm not mistaken, from 1908, one of the first yeah. studies that shows that uh, uh, th this shows that too little stress is bad. It's boring. Too much stress is bad. It's uh, it hurts, and you need the right amount of stress for peak performance. Mm -hmm. Right. It's it's all it's all piecing together everything we've talked about in this conversation. Thank you so much for your time, Tal. Thank you, Adam, and uh, thank you for, um, for for talking about these ideas and making them accessible to um, to many people. Very grateful for that. You as well. I love the work you're doing.